In a recent interview with Bill Gates, he voices concern regarding what he sees as one of the greatest threats currently facing humanity. We're not ready, he explains. We're not ready for the next disease that will wipe out millions of people in six months. Many in the scientific community are sounding the alarm as well that we are facing an unprecedented challenge in the next several years, the likes of which we've never seen, that will quite simply be devastating. In this video, we'll cover five reasons a plague is inevitable in the not so distant future and the reasons why little, if anything, can be done by governments to prevent this from happening. At the end, we'll briefly discuss how you can begin to prepare now to ready yourself and your family. This video is sponsored by Mira Safety, a company which sells gear used specifically by military forces around the world, including the United States, to provide chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear protection. Click on the link in the description section below and use coupon code CITY10 to receive 10% off of your next purchase to ensure you'll be ready for the next pandemic. Before we jump into the reasons the next plague is inevitable, let's take a quick look at one of the common recurring deadly diseases from the last century, influenza. Several times a century, influenza sweeps across the globe. Between 1918 and 1919, the Spanish influenza killed 50 million people worldwide with 675,000 in the United States alone. Between 1957 and 1958, the Asian influenza killed 4 million people in the world and 70,000 in the United States. One reason that the Asian flu was it as deadly as the Spanish flu was that an American scientist named Maurice Hillman saw it coming and made a vaccine to prevent it. There have also been subsequent pandemics of influenza with the H3 virus causing the Hong Kong pandemic of 1968, the H1 virus which caused a mini pandemic of 1986, and the H1 pandemic of 2009 which caused 265,000 Americans to be hospitalized and 12,000 to die. Now, this example is just influenza, which is a highly communicable infectious disease. There are many other diseases that have continued to present real problems, and with the perfect combination of factors we'll discuss in this video, influenza, like many others, could easily spread and do severe damage before the scientific community is able to provide a vaccine or state and local authorities are able to quarantine the illness. So let's run through the factors why a devastating plague is inevitable in the coming years. Number one, human growth into nature is causing more diseases to emerge. A perfect example of this can be seen in an article written by The Atlantic written in July of 2018, where they document how in developing nations such as Congo, contracting diseases is becoming a bigger problem as each year passes. A quick side note, at the time of the release of this video, an Ebola outbreak is currently occurring in Congo. The Congo is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. It was here that HIV turned into a pandemic, eventually detected halfway around the world in California. It was here that monkeypox was first documented in people. In the Congo, several zoonotic diseases, which originate in animals and spill over into humans, have occurred. Wherever people push into wildlife-rich habitats, the potential for such spillover diseases jumping from animals to humans is high. Sub-Saharan Africans' population will more than double during the next three decades, and urban centers will extend further into the wilderness, bringing large groups of immunological naive people into contact with the pathogens that reside in animal reserves loss of fever from rats, monkeypox from primates and rodents, and Ebola. The same situation has occurred in countries like in Southeast Asia. As more and more of the population pushes into parts of the wilderness untouched before, the likelihood that a disease can pass from animals to humans is significantly increased. In the past, Congo has had a good history of containing its diseases, partially because travel is so challenging due to poor infrastructure. Large distances and poor travel infrastructure limit the spread of Ebola outbreaks in years past. But that is changing now. A 340-mile road connects a small village where Ebola breakouts have occurred to Kinshasha. In 1995, that road was so badly maintained that the journey took more than a week. Now the road is paved. The travel time is just eight hours. 12 million people live in Kinshasa, three times the combined population of the capitals affected by the 2014 West African outbreak. With eight international flights departing daily from the city's airport, a disease emerging from this area and spreading quickly around the globe is highly likely, which leads us to our next point. Point number two, air travel is making it easier to spread diseases. As detailed in the last point, as more and more smaller cities are being connected with improved infrastructure to larger cities that contain airports, the likelihood that a pathogen will inevitably be carried from ground zero to larger city centers where the disease will rapidly spread, undetected during an incubation period, increases daily. For example, we just looked at an example of Ebola. Ebola has a 2 to 21 day incubation period. During this time interval from infection to onset of symptoms, the host could easily travel outside of that initial area 
or infection occurred. Once they begin to show symptoms, they can infect new unsuspecting victims. By the time the authorities have figured out that Ebola has started becoming an issue in the initial ground zero location, the carrier has already begun to spread the disease outside the quarantine area. In this video from the Gates Foundation YouTube channel, you can observe a simple simulation of how a global flu pandemic could occur. As the Atlantic article states, globalization compounds a risk. Airplanes now carry almost 10 times as many passengers around the world as they did four decades ago. In the 1980s, HIV showed how potent new diseases can be by launching a slow-moving pandemic that has since claimed about 35 million lives. In 2003, another newly discovered virus, SARS, spread decidedly more quickly. A Chinese seafood seller hospitalized passed it to dozens of doctors and nurses, one of whom traveled to Hong Kong for a wedding. In a single night, he infected at least 16 others, who then carried the virus to Canada, Singapore, and Vietnam. Within six months, SARS had reached 29 countries and infected more than 8,000 people. This is a new epic of disease, when geographic barriers disappear and threats that once would have been local go global. No place on Earth is more than a multi-hour jet flight from any place else. This kind of complexity vastly increases our vulnerability to diseases being spread. It allows for cascades of transmission. Point number three, antibiotic resistance strains of diseases are emerging. I graduated from the University of Texas with a degree of microbiology nearly 20 years ago. During my studies there, this was one of the greatest concerns in this field of study in regards to human infectious diseases, an antibiotic resistant disease which would inevitably emerge. The development of antibiotics, antivirals, and antimalarials are some of modern medicine's greatest successes. Now, time with those drugs is running out. The World Health Organization labels antibiotic resistance as one of the biggest threats to global health, food security, and development today. Antibiotic resistance occurs naturally, but misuse of antibiotics in humans and animals is accelerating the process. A growing number of infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, and salmonella are becoming harder and harder to treat as the antibiotics used to treat them become less effective. The inability to prevent infections could seriously compromise surgery and procedures such as chemotherapy. Resistance to tuberculosis drugs is a formidable obstacle to fighting a disease that causes around 10 million people to fall ill and 1.6 million to die every year. In 2017, around 600,000 cases of tuberculosis were resistant to one of the most common effective first-line drugs, and 82% of these people had multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Where antibiotics can be bought for human or animal use without a prescription, the emergence and spread of resistance is made worse. In countries without standard treatment guidelines, antibiotics are often overprescribed by health workers and veterinarians and overused by the public. Without urgent action, we are heading for a post-antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries can once again kill. While there are some new antibiotics in development, none of them are expected to be effective against the most dangerous forms of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Given the ease and frequency with which people now travel, antibiotic resistance is now a global problem. Point number four, basic economics. More and more of the decisions made by those in the medical system in the United States is driven simply by economics. Our infrastructure and supply chain depends on a just-in-time medical economy, in which stockpiles are limited and even key items are made to order. Most of the intravenous bags used in the country are manufactured in Puerto Rico. So when Hurricane Maria devastated the island in September of 2017, the bags fell in short supply. The most common life-saving drugs all depend on long supply chains that include India and China, chains that would likely break in a severe pandemic. Each year, the system gets leaner and leaner. It doesn't take much of a hiccup anymore to challenge it. Pandemics cause problems for vaccine manufacturers as well. Most flu vaccines are made by growing viruses and chicken eggs, the same archaic method that's been used for 70 years. Every strain grows differently, so manufacturers must constantly adjust to each new strain. The process works reasonably well for seasonal flu, which arrives on a predictable schedule, but it fails miserably for pandemic strains, which are unpredictable. Vaccine makers have few incentives to use anything else apart from the egg-based system. Switching to a different process would cost billions, and why bother? Flu vaccines are low-margin products, which only about 45% of Americans get in a normal year. So when demand soars during a pandemic, the supply chain will not be ready. In addition, hospitals operate at close to full capacity during normal times to run a lean business to maximize profits. If a pandemic hits, hospitals would not be equipped to handle this overflow. When a disease occurs, it takes time to prepare the vaccines, and depending on the disease, it may take several months to ramp up production enough to help the population. By the time a vaccine reaches market, depending on the severity, it may be too late. When the next inevitable pandemic hits, 
there will be very little that hospitals will be able to do. Point number five, vaccine hesitancy. This issue is a reluctance or refusal to vaccinate despite the availability of vaccines. It threatens the reverse progress made in tackling vaccine preventable diseases. Vaccination is one of the most cost-effective ways of avoiding disease. It currently prevents two to three million deaths a year, and a further 1.5 million could be avoided if global coverage of vaccinations improved. Measles, for example, has seen a 30% increase in cases globally. The reasons for this rise are complex, and not all these cases are due to vaccine hesitancy. However, some countries that were close to eliminating the disease have seen a resurgence. The reasons why people choose not to vaccinate are complex. A vaccines advisory group to the World Health Organization identify complacency, inconvenience in accessing vaccines, and a lack of confidence as key reasons underlying hesitancy. According to the FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, the one single thing that would vastly improve the healthcare system is if people would get vaccinated. America could find itself in the midst of an epidemic of dangerous preventable diseases that have already started to resurface due in part to those that are hesitant to vaccinate. How to begin to prepare now. In light of the information presented in this video, what can someone do to prepare for this inevitability? The reality is that when the next big pandemic hits, the only possibility you have of survival is to do all you can to isolate yourself from the general population. Until a vaccine specifically designed for the specific pathogen comes to market, your best bet is to wait it out. A movie that does a decent job of portraying how the scenarios we detailed could easily unfold is Contagion. It's definitely worth a watch. In order to stay at home, having a well-stocked pantry of food and other basic supplies prior to the pandemic occurring will be critical. I'll do a future video detailing this more in depth. Also, some form of protective gear, especially one that is designed to protect your respiratory system, will be very helpful. A protective suit and mask could be invaluable if it's within your budget. I'll post a link to where you can purchase these items. At a minimum, having N95 respirators could offer some level of protection. You can pick these up online as well at your local hardware store. While the details outlined in this video could be construed as grim and do not paint an overly optimistic picture for the future, awareness is key and preparing is critical. By simply ignoring the information presented in this video and passing it off as fear bait, you overlook a great deal of evidence that is being corroborated by scientists in the medical community. By taking steps to prepare, you give yourself a much better chance of survival. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it, please click on the like button, share on social media, and as always, be safe out there.